Uh, yeah, so welcome to the Open Democracy and Participatory Hacking uh, session. Got to get my notes up. So um, what I'd like to do is just do a quick introduction to um, kind of what is participatory democracy and civic hacking. So it's audience participation time. Who has got a good idea what participatory democracy means? Or, you know, a reasonable idea? Very few. Okay, about, what about civic hacking? Hooray, this is going to be a learning session. Okay, so I define civic hacking as kind of citizens doing it for themselves. So creating tools, digital tools mainly, um, where government can't or won't act. So uh, we kind of touched on that before with planning alerts. Uh, that's a space where, can you imagine trying to get 500 councils to agree on something? Yeah, right, okay, I didn't think so. Um, this also means using government data or not, so something like planning alerts does, but it could also be another project like election leaflets, which is another one we run. Sorry, I'm gonna be banging on about my own projects, but uh, I've got some other people that'll do the same. Um, election leaflets allows people to scan election leaflets and then upload them, and that kind of stops the shenanigans that goes on you know, during an election, and that's also civic hacking. Um, participatory democracy, at least for this forum, is really about digital, right? Um, so in some ways the Occupy movement could be considered um, a, a form of participatory democracy. Um, I certainly think they thought that. Um, but what we're talking about here in today's forum is, is really digital tools. Um, so that can um, take a few different forms. There's top-down, where the government kind of um, engages citizens in decision-making or policy development, and we've heard a bit about that today. Um, it's at its early stages in Australia, but there's lots and lots of stuff happening, which is really cool. Um, but there's also bottom-up, which is where I'm interested in, and that's driven by civil society organisations like the Open Australia Foundation. Um, it's, it, it can be supported and encouraged by um, government, which is what I'd really like, but that doesn't really happen much in Australia yet. Um, some other things that we'll be discussing today will be why, why are these concepts important, um, what, what's being done, you know, what are some existing projects out there. Um, today's session will run by, um, I'm going to get each of the speakers just to give a short talk like um, we have for the other panels, and then um, we'll then go into the conversational mode where everyone can have a chat. So, I'm going to introduce our panel now. Stephen, if you can put up your hand. Stephen is the uh, Executive Director of Link Digital, a Canberra-based digital agency that has been around since 2001. According to LinkedIn endorsements, he is most recognized as a market, marketing strategist. Despite that blight on his rep reputation, he's actually a web dev at heart. Currently, he is leveraging Drupal to deliver enterprise solutions to clients such as ActTab and the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, Alzheimer's Australia, and the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. He's going to be discussing some common features found in online collaboration platforms and how cooperative funding and the aggregation of market requirements will drive the product roadmap for the next generation of web applications. We have uh, Gavin. Gavin is currently working with the ACT government in the Government Information Office. Prior to that, he was with the Federal Government, Lifeline Australia, the ABC, Optus and Vodafone. With the exception of about a year, he has not worked in IT departments, instead finding himself as the translator between the business and IT. Outside work, Gavin is active in creating opportunities for smart people to share ideas. He has been involved with organising events like GovHack and GovCamp, along with BarCamp Canberra and TEDx Canberra. He'd like to talk about why government needs more geeks working in non-IT jobs and how they can make government more awesome. Craig Tomler. Craig is a Government 2.0 and open data advocate with a background in technology um, and resource startups who recently spent five years leading online initi initiatives in the federal government. He stepped back into the private sector last year to lead digital democracy company DLib in New Zealand and Australia and remains very active in the open government area, blogging at probably one of, well, I'd say almost certainly Australia's oldest um, blog on this topic, eGovAU. He's going to talk about how open government can't simply be about releasing information and data and discuss approaches for citizens um, inside the tent. Alex? Alex, by day, is an IT consultant specialising in service-oriented architecture. Announcer, please groan. Oh, groan. By night, he is an amateur data scientist, cracking the code of what makes government and democracy tick. His projects have provided greater insight into many, re um, many sources of open data, from government spending and political donations, FOI requests, and local bus timetables. 
Alex would like to talk about the challenges in civic hacking, how, we do, how, how do we build better tools to enable people to engage with the democratic process and where we are failing behind. Uh, I'm Hanari Deegan. I think I talked about this before. I'm a volunteer and director at the Open Australia Foundation. We're a community-based and volunteer-driven participatory democracy and civic hacking charity, or as we like to say, we hack democracy. We create digital projects in the public interest and we've built and currently run four major projects and counting. And I would like to have a bit of a talk about those projects um, and what make, motivates me personally as a hacker to work on these and the importance of civil society organisations in general. So, I'd like to invite Alex first. Hi, so um, there's a dangerous idealism of technologists. I mean, they think people wouldn't make such dumb decisions in democracy if they just knew more. And I mean, facts, facts, political facts are like data, and we know how to manage data. So if we just make some app, then everyone will be able to make better decisions. Unfortunately, people make these like they make to-do apps and mobile phone photo sharing networks, and they just linger. So what can technology actually provide for democracy? Well, we've actually seen in government that technologies like maps, where you're able to select on the map where the problem is, or wikis, where you can collaboratively define a document, these are good ways to consult. But people don't necessarily get involved. The, uh, former Victorian Premier tried to have a Ask the Premier YouTube channel, which got 300 hits and had two questions, both of which were about football and probably planted by his staff. So how do you get people there? Well, what I've actually found works is Google. I mean, people don't, probably don't Google, how do I fix my government? But they do seem to Google a lot about um, about different political parties they've heard, different companies, different people. And what a lot of my projects do is provide results for those. So for example, a shadowy lobby lobbyist company probably doesn't have their own website. So when people search for that lobbyist, they actually get my website, which tells you all of the donations they've made and what government uh, suppliers use them. So, in the last week, for example, um, you may have heard of Nova Paris, the anointed uh, next to be senator for the Northern Territory. As it turns out, I've seen a lot of hits for her on my website because she's received lots of large contracts to promote indigenous health. And a lot of um, very conservative bloggers have been hitting my site repeatedly, trying to find some dirt on her. But I mean, uh, the lobbyists are more fun because they actually seem to come out of government um, proxies. So people in government are actually taking the time to search for lobbyists before they let them talk to public servants and ministers. Um, but then what if people get to these oracles? I mean, the people who were looking for Nova Paris's companies probably didn't want to write a complaint then. They just wanted to know the facts. And it's really hard to know what next. Like, once someone has found uh, what they think is a government scandal, what do they do? Do they write to a journalist? Do they write to a politician? I don't think anyone actually did that in this case. So you need the long tail of the engagers. You know, those conservative bloggers that picked up on this, the journalists that ream these databases. My favorite example is um, in Canada, when some consultant was uh, entering all the charity donations to see, you know, what is the largest charity in, uh, what, what are the different, what's the size of total contributions in Canada? And they made this spreadsheet and they sorted it and they realized that the top two charities they'd never heard of. And it turns out that they were actually massive tax fraud. Actually, 3.2 billion Canadian dollars, 100,000 taxpayers had been using these companies. And that money, half a percent of the national budget, was recovered because someone thought, I could use a spreadsheet. <laughs> so, investigative journalism is pretty expensive. And it looks to me that you need these teams of people, not just technologists who can analyze, you know, make the data, but you need people who can analyze it and actually act on it. And um, I think one of the best ways this has been happening recently is things with change.org, where they have petitions and people have communities around an issue. 
but you kind of need that with a bit of a Kickstarter to get people who have the skills, you know, get bread on their table so they can focus on investigating these things. And, you know, if they don't find anything, well, at least we tried. I mean, fundamentally what we need is better data literacy. People don't think to search for these things online yet because they don't know that government provides this data freely. So we need, um, you know, these keen groups of people, as we were talking before about community organisations that work with charities, we need them to understand that this data is available. So in the ACT, we're about to do a consultation on the future bus network. And I've been watching some of the people who are really keen about that, you know, public transportation advocates. They've actually been looking at the data that comes out to tell the timetables and thinking, hey, actually, this is wrong. And we could make a completely alternative timetable and send it to the government, and then they'd have to respond to that. I don't think these challenges are insurmountable, but the path ahead isn't clear. I mean, these tools to help people collaborate on analysing data don't exist yet. But uh, hopefully we'll get there. Thanks. All right. Hello, everybody. So I'm Stephen DeCosta from Link Digital. Um, I'm just going to talk about a couple of things. I have to remember what they are. So I think I said it was the ingredients for community of collaboration, something like that, building a collaboration platform, and aggregating users' needs in order to um, develop something like the next generation of web apps. So I'll try and loop back to those two things with a bit of a tail and not go over the five minutes and keep uh, everyone's minds open for questions. So um, basically, I'd been in this lecture hall before I did a, um, a economics degree back in the day, um, and I kind of learned about supply and demand. That gave me a good sort of uh, footing for working in the internet and building web applications and websites for people. So back in 2000, there was a hell of a lot of supply around things like e-commerce sites. Everyone thought they could make a lot of money out of building uh, these great sites that sold a lot of things to a lot of consumers. The bubble in that hall burst for a number of different reasons, but essentially the way I broke it down to it, and over time you can kind of always see these things, is that uh, there wasn't enough demand, obviously, to sustain the amount of investment and supply that was going in. Now there is. There is actually a lot of people with a lot of learned behaviour that they've um, created over the, you know, the subsequent years on how to shop online. They feel comfortable. Um, they have an innate knowledge, almost, well not innate, but they have a learned <laughs> behavioural knowledge about how to shop, how to detect the right sort of websites, how to find the right commodities that they're interested in. Now that supply and demand equation is extremely important when you're th talking about things like uh, open democracy. Democracy is essentially um, a response to the demand for good governance, good politicians rising up from a community of people and representing their issues on their behalf. So when we're thinking about how we can uh, really untap the market for uh, open democracy, it, it's, you can think in those terms of supply and demand. I think that uh, having data sets and APIs is the supply side of the equation. Having a bunch of technical people understand how to connect into those and build interesting applications is also like, well, it's the startup side of the equation. But if you don't have a good business understanding of where the demand is going to be driving the use of that supply, then you're missing the opportunity to really connect. Now, um, a couple of the projects that I'm involved in, uh, govhack.org is a great example of building a community of collaboration. And I wanted to go back to that. There were three simple ingredients in the way that I see uh, communities forming. You don't have to worry about tools, you don't have to worry about techniques and uh, sort of little mini applications like a, a, a poll of you know, what you want to do and user forums and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think collaboration is around creating a persistence of profiles and there are three types of profiles that you want to create. One is an individual, so users who use an online website that might be formed around a community of interest need to have their in individual profile and that's about having persistence over time. They may very lightly integrate with the opportunity to do stuff. They may not be posting lots of articles into this environment but they want to have a persistent profile. That's good for the whole community. It means that every incremental person that registers becomes part of the greater whole. The second thing is a natural formation of groups within the community. You need to have something that organically forms around micro communities of interest. So those individuals come together, they start to interact, they say a few things about, well, I'm interested in civic hacking. They form a bit of a community of interest and their own group emerges. 
That leads on to the third thing that you need, which is something like a project, something that can bind people, like a mission statement um, that they actually participate around. Now, it doesn't need to literally be one project, um, but in the GovHack example, we do have a group of people last year came together, about 140 developers in two geographic locations over about two, two to three days, and they all came together, they built an application based on open data sets, competed, but they ultimately had a project at the end of that process. Those three things were able to drive that community together um, and have the outcomes. Over time, we want to be able to build that further and further. Now, going back to the next generation of web apps, um, I guess it's good with this audience to bag Microsoft. And particularly, like my, the most fun thing to bag is SharePoint, because it's just so hor horrible. Um, and as a web dev, it kind of it really hurts your soul to think that people are building websites that claim to be collaborative environments on SharePoint. It might be a great information management system and manage things like documents and workflows and things like that. But when you try and propagate that up the stack and push it in front of people and make it look like a real website and maybe make it comply with accessibility standards, you're going to have a really hard time. Now, Microsoft have aggregated the needs of users and they have sensibly defined a product roadmap for SharePoint globally, I don't think the needs of those users are being met by that single entity being Microsoft. Within the open source community, you have a different paradigm emerging where the aggregation of demand or suppliers, um, technical suppliers, have been able to generate projects which have real outcomes. Outcomes like Drupal, outcomes like WordPress and Joomla. And I see that as almost like the developer's requirements being aggregated and met. They are repeatedly having to be building websites. They have to be themes. They have to customize them with additional plugins or modules. And so their needs have been aggregated into these three distinct projects as examples. What we have now is an opportunity to look beyond that and understand that the users of those content management systems, as to take this example further, are now aggregating around their requirements. Within the world of Drupal, you're seeing things called distributions to meet the aggregated needs of communities of interest there. So you have distributions like Open Publish, uh, Open Public, sorry, which are meeting the needs of government, small agencies to, out of a, a quick bag of tricks, build a, a public-facing website. Open Publish, which is one around sort of like newspaper type um, publishing systems. Al Jazeera have something like that um, running behind their platform. Um, I think the big win for anyone working in open government, open data, is to really think about how they can form a community of interest where there's an existing demand for a real outcome in the world. Um, if you're speaking to a local council around meeting a particular need, um, don't just focus on that one council. Look at all the councils and then the different tiers of government and look all the way across the whole market for those who might be able to in have interest in this application or this service that you're trying to provide and really work on creating that demand mechanism. Because then if you do build um, a civic orientated app or construct that creates a, a better public outcome, you've already got the demand for it. Um, a lot of people in the last session and um, even Alex was talking about meeting this demand with you know, Google techniques. Um, we're talking about you know, the best thing to do was to uh, get, get involved in Twitter and really harass the government. That's their representation of demand, and that's what democracy is about. If you do harass government and you do bring together a big enough voice, then change will occur. Um, I should wrap it up, so sorry. Cool. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, um, just a question for everyone first. How many people in the room consider themselves as programmers or hackers? Okay, it's only half to three quarters of the room. Um, I'd just like to let you all know something, democracy is not about you. Um, I think one of the challenges we face today with, with digitalization, with open government, with the focus on civic hacking and those things, is there's, is there's this link between democracy and programming, with the idea that it's got to be the programmers who set us free, who help unlock the information, who help release the secrets, and who help actually make democracies work as they should. Um, the interesting thing is that democracies have worked in varying forms and various ways for a couple of thousand years. Um, without the benefit of programmers, without the benefit of, of technologies uh, that we have today. Um, and I think, you know, you have to get back to what's the fundamentals of democracies. And it's basically
basically about people being involved in decision making processes. And I think when you're talking about the contribution that um, data and programming and hacking make to democracy, it's about looking at how do they actually support the wider community to get more engaged and more involved in the decision making process. It's not about how can an elite group of hackers stand out there and create these great apps that everybody else will then choose to use. So it's a, it's a bit of a thing because we talk about co-design and how government needs to co-design its policies, co-design its services. I'd also say hackers need to co-design their solutions as well. We're saying, what, how does the general population relate to a particular app you make? Were they involved in the, in, in the actual idea of it? Were they involved in the construction of it? And were they actually involved in using it after it was built? Because something I see a lot of, and as a non-programmer who's been um, you know, talking about um, the topic of open data and open government for well over five years now, what I see uh, emerging is these wonderful groups of, of very, very skilled and talented programmers emerging around the world who built these great applications. Um, and they're all fantastic in their own right, and they do useful things. But Alex uh, actually suggested these things have to be accessible and they have to be uh, usable by the general population, because otherwise you're not actually solving the goal that they're set out to actually achieve. Um, so it's important, don't get hung up on the technology and how it lets you do something new and brilliant. Look at what the outcome it actually delivers. Um, and again, as Steve was saying, it's all about you know what's the actual outcome you're delivering delivering, and is it the outcome that's going to be a benefit to democracy and society? Um, so anybody out there who is a programmer, what I suggest is you actually try and link up with some people who aren't programmers, who know nothing about technology, um, sort of your grandparents or someone like that, and actually say what would actually help you get more involved in the decisions that are being made today, or help you feel better informed or uh, able to make better decisions um, and better choices in who represents you politically or what topics you should individually get involved with. And actually look at how you can actually empower them rather than empowering yourself, empower them to be the, the, the moving forward, uh, have that impact on, um, on our democracy and make sure the changes that people want to see are actually enacted. So, thank you. Afternoon. I'm Gavin Tapp and I'm currently working at the ACT government. Uh, if you were here in the previous session, you would have seen Christo Norman speak, and I work uh, sometimes with him. And uh, uh, so I own a very small team within the ACT government of, I think, two, three people, depending on the day of the week you're in there. And we're interested in looking at the way the ACT government manages information. So we're interested in open data. Uh, but beyond that, we're interested in how can the ACT government change the way it manages data to be more uh, digital first. Who's that me? So it's really interested in how we can achieve change from the way government's been done in the past to the way government can be done in the future. And as Christo mentioned, we have this great opportunity in the ACT with a mandate from the Chief Minister to um, go forth and, and do some of these things. So we've got that sort of nice, strong endorsement from uh, the very top of our tree, which is really, really important. Because we're in Canberra, I'd like to do a couple of little tests in the audience here. So uh, are there any people here that currently work for the uh, federal government? And just raise a hand. So a little bit, maybe 10%, maybe. Any ACT government? Excellent. Two, two of us, right on. The point I really want to make about um, participatory democracy and civic hacking is that government isn't just the vote you cast in your federal or state elections every three or four years. Government happens in a thousand little decisions that get made every week and every day. And there's a lot of opportunity to um, participate in how those decisions are made. Um, and what I think, in my view, government can really benefit on from is people from this community coming to work inside the government and to bring your knowledge of how technology can work in, into the government so that when those little decisions are made and those discussions are being had about, um, gee, I really don't like working with SharePoint, oh, did you know there's you know, a bunch of really good alternatives? That information is not very um, well distributed through government. There's not a really good awareness of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, in my 
brief bio, I kind of said I've been standing on the outside of IT departments for most of my career, throwing little stones at them saying, hey, you know, can we, can we use something different? Can we try something open source? Can we not use SharePoint? That kind of thing. Um, we need more people kind of doing that sort of thing, working with the business areas and understanding what it is that you want to do. We want to better respond to our citizens, our clients. We're getting requests for open data. How can we do this kind of stuff? How can we better collaborate on documents that are taking us months to produce now so that we're not working as slowly? How can we take advantage of all this technology that's bubbling up at the moment? Um, and how do we get our business areas within government to start using them? For the most part, IT departments in probably big organisations and in government, they're busy running enterprise stuff. They're busy running file servers and security stuff and mail servers and all that kind of thing. They're not necessarily spending a lot of time thinking about how they could use technology differently. Somebody needs to do that. It's the business parts of government and businesses that kind of understand the objectives that they've got. They understand how much money they've got. They need some expertise there beyond what their IT team are giving them so that they know what opportunities are there, what technology is available, how much it might cost, how quickly they could do it. Which segues nicely, I think, into the role of hack days in the community. Has anyone here been to a, a hack day of some sort? Anyone? Anyone here organised one? Some? Great. Does everyone know what, what, what a hack day is? Would anyone like a definition or kind of a brief description? No? I, well, anyway, it's when, basically as an organiser of that kind of event, what I do is I find a space that has fast internet connection and I put some people in it and I say, do some cool stuff. And I stand back and kind of let it happen. If we are working closely with government, we get um, some government sponsorship and they might say, gee, we'd really like to see somebody use this type of data set or produce this kind of product at the end. You know, it might be a, a map for how to escape from disaster scenarios, or it could be anything, a problem that they're trying to solve. Um, that's such a great opportunity for people who understand technology to sort of feed back into government some of the opportunities that are there and to give government a wake-up call about how quickly and how cheaply some of this stuff can be done, at least to a pr prototype kind of sense. If you haven't worked in government or large businesses, when you have a new idea about using technology, the process is typically something like this. Um, uh, gee, I think we'd like to do this a bit better than how we do it now. Who, I think it uses a computer, and we should be using computers better. I think there's software that'll do this. I can use Facebook, so I'm kind of ready to do technology things. I'll better go and talk to IT. IT says, oh, okay, interesting, okay. We better assign a business an analysis sort of person or team to this to kind of try and scope out what this might cost and how much it might take, and that person will cost $150 an hour. And the business unit goes, oh. Gee, it was just a good idea that we kind of wanted to test. We weren't quite ready to kind of write the paper that we would need to write to get that analysis done. And all of a sudden it kind of stops. Until you can kind of convince someone that you have 20 grand that's worth exploring the idea to see if it's worth testing. So immediately the, the stakes go up and the risks go up and there's sort of this barrier to exploring things. Hack days are fantastic for getting around that. You could go to the hack day and say, gee, we'd really like to see a better way of producing uh, documents where you know, different parts of government can collaborate on something in a way that lets us track changes. And for this kind of community, that's such an obvious day-to-day -day thing that's already been solved so many times. The hack day, I would expect a bunch of teams would come up with something that shows how you can use GitHub for doing that in different ways. So it's a really quick way of providing feedback to government on how they can work better. The thing I sort of want to leave you with is that um, as technologists or people that work in government or people that want more from their government, you are the ones who can influence what you get. And it's by asking your government for things. It's by going to Hackfest and demonstrating ways that things can be done. If you work for government, it's about, you know, jumping into those conversations and saying, well, hey, did you know that there is a project that does that or whatever? And you might kind of feel a bit tired of doing that after a while, but it's really important because there are people in government who want to be made aware of those opportunities and they want to explore them. And, uh, you know, if you find the right people, they're really keen to, to talk to you. And, you know, it could lead to great things for you and great things for government and great things for the population. Okie dokie, well, they're running rather behind, funnily enough. 
So I'm going to keep mine really uh, brief, and I'm only going to talk about one thing that I wanted to talk about. And it's telling you a story, and it's to do with LCA, so I figured uh, it would be a good little story to tell. And it's about my motivations for um, being a civic hacker and hacking democracy. Um, it was 2009, uh, so a few years back. I was, you know, kind of politically engaged. Um, I, I, I'd like to get involved in politics, but like like most of us, especially most Australians, I kind of felt um, disempowered. So yes, have you crossed that off your buzzword bingo? Um, I, I'd really, I, you know, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know, you know, do I join a political party? Do I go to rallies? Do I, you know, write nasty grams to the minister every other week? You know, how do I get involved in government? So I went along to LCA because I'm also a free software hacker, and um, and I'd been using free software for a number of years by then. And this was in Tasmania, and I met this guy called Matthew Landauer, who's the guy, one of the co-founders of the Open Australia Foundation. Um, I'd, I'd seen his talk earlier in the day and I'd, I'd also seen his website and so I was like, this Open Australia thing sucks, it's got a bug, right? It's right there on the front page, it's an obvious bug. So I went up to him and I complained and he turned around and did the typical kind of open source thing and he turned around and said to me, yeah, why don't you fix it? It's open source, <laughs> duh. So okay, right, all right, that's what I did. I went, went back to my dorm and I went, all right, stuff it, I'm gonna fix this. And so sure enough, I hadn't really done much programming at that stage, this is you know, like four or five years ago, and um, so I fiddled around with this PHP thing that he'd got, worked out how to use this new Git thing that I was just starting to learn about, and I, that was my first ever open source contribution. I'd been using it for years, but now I was contributing to it. Um, and, that's, and, and by doing that, I then started to hack more on these projects and I realized that as a, just as a normal lay citizen, I could actually have an impact, a huge impact, on um, what goes on around me, my government, my built environment through things like planning alerts. Um, and so I'd say to all of the hackers and non-hackers, because it's not just about programming, it's certainly not about the technology, um, you can have a huge difference by getting involved in this space. It, it's not, um, by, by doing very small things you can make a, a, a very large difference. And with the government um, helping us at the moment by releasing data, we should really take that opportunity now. So I think we'll go to questions. This is where you guys come in. Um, has there been a speaker that said something that riled you up? Please put up your hand and um, we can discuss it. Do you have a robot? Yep. yep. Come on. Go on up the back. I'm going to bring up a Twitter argument we had a while ago. Hey. So we talked about the, uh, the hack event. and. I'm going to play the, the bad guy a little bit here because I'm a massive supporter of the hack events. I think they're absolutely fantastic. But how can we make them better? So the question is, of out of the GovHack um, hacks that occurred and all the rest of them, how many are still around? Ah, so this is uh, our, our Twitter conversation because then I would say, oh, there was like two or something like that. There you yeah, go. Yeah, right. Yeah. So the I, question I, is to the panel is... Yeah, I was the one who said HackFest are good. He was the one who said nothing good comes from them. <laughs> oh, that's a bit harsh. See, we're already rattling it up. I suppose yeah. I'm just wanting to wake myself up a little bit. But the question of the panel is quite simple. Um, you're all involved in this space. Um, how do we make this better? How do we actually make these hacks that are occurring in these events actually permeate. And I'm not saying they don't permeate, but at least we're not measuring it in such a way that we can turn around to politicians and government and say, look at the effect that this has actually had and the power it's had. So what's the solution? Um, we're trying to do that. So the last uh, gov hack, as we said, two of them are actually up. I think it's actually more than that. <laughs> but there was a lot of, because they were prototypes, a lot of them didn't stay up. But the ideas behind them have been filtering into, for example, the ACT government and the National Archives have been taking on the things they saw and saying, oh, well, we can actually use that. And we're planning to feed that back into future hackfests. So before we get people involved, we say, you know, you do this, and if something good comes from it, here is how you can actually keep it sustainable. But I think the idea with having all these prototypes some of them, you know, they're just prototypes. You know, we thought it was a good idea, but actually when you implement it, it doesn't work. Well, we've learned something, but there's not really, you know, you don't know where to go from there. But the ones that were really good, the ones that won prizes, the ones that 
people were really excited about, those are the ones that we can feed back into government to be used. Cool. Yeah, I guess to add on that a little bit, uh, in a way, hackfests run by government are a way for government to outsource risk. Because rather than government trying all these things and spending lots of money building all these prototypes, one after the other using a couple of programmers, they're all done in one room by a big group of programmers at once and they're able to see what's good and what's bad. So you shouldn't judge a hack fest on how many apps survive out of it, but you should actually look at how many of those ideas end up getting adopted over time. Um, but more importantly than that, I think in Australia still, the way we've run hack fests has been sort of the first phase of where these come about, which is basically government releases a lot of data and says, go do something with it. Let's see if you do anything interesting. And that's, that's, that's sort of where a lot of countries started. Where most of them have moved, and where Australia is starting to move now, is actually coming up with, okay, this is the problem, come up with hacks that solve that problem. And we're seeing that in a couple of forms. Uh, New South Wales today, uh, Apps for Health, um, actual um, competition, where they're saying come up with hacks that would help with healthcare in, Australia, in, in New South Wales. So that's starting to get more targeted. Over in the US, you have challenge.gov, where they're basically putting up very, very precise issues and saying, come up with a hack of some type, whether it be programmed or just a website or something else, that actually addresses this solution. So I think it's something that we'll see evolving in Australia over time, and we'll get much more specific, government will get much more specific about using this approach, which is getting a bunch of people to come up with ideas, in a much more refined way. Um, so it just takes time. It goes through generations. Cool. Okay, let's do two more really rapid fire questions because we're getting towards the end of the session can while I, we're doing that. Gavin? I just add something really quickly to those, Anyone? those answers. Anyone? Got a uh, question? Outside the, um, the, the hacks that are product yep. of the hack day, there's all sorts of other, well, there's some really tangible benefits as oh, well uh. to people. So participants who come along to the hack day is often comment afterwards that it was some of the best professional development that they've had, much more valuable than the several thousand dollar course they might have attended that their work paid for. So um, there's benefits to individuals and organisations in upskilling their staff. Um, and it's great to sort of let, you know, normally constrained IT dev types kind of cut loose and actually build something and flex those muscles, that's really important. Also, the recent GovHack, the people that we had from government who um, came to present prizes and things were, you know, dev secretaries and secretaries and things like that. And it's really a, a vehicle to get the attention of those senior um, public servants and make them understand the value of this stuff and have a conversation with them. I think if we weren't having these hack fests, um, it would be harder to find those opportunities to talk to those people and explain to them why you need to really start up, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. So they're a really important part of the ecosystem around, um, you know, um, citizen engagement, open democracy, that kind of thing. Cool. What's the next question? Uh, June, July. One June. Uh, one, one June. Yep, go to the question. Um, this leads on to this discussion that Gavin and I have had, but also from things that have just been coming up. If you go to the uh, the FOI, Open Government Australia site, I can't remember the, what the sub site Right to know? Yeah. So having browsed that and having seen a number of different actual government implementations of FOI handling, Open Govs is amazing and looks a lot better. Um, how can we reduce that amount of double effort that's produced where open civic groups like Open Australia do something really awesome and meanwhile there are government agencies around the world which are implementing often lagging behind the very same functionality. Is there a way of bringing these people in either directly or is there a way even with, that a government could turn around and say hey Open Australia that is amazing could you tailor that for us and we'll just give your organization a bucket load of money. Can I, can I just chip in before Alex if he knows more about this than I do. Can I so I'm sitting here in kind of my ACD government hat, and can I just say I'm aware of Right to Know, and I think it's been released as an open source package, yeah. right? So the conversation that I want to have in my part of ACD government is, why don't we pick up that package and use it? So we are aware of it, and I think we are willing to look at it and say, like, does this solve the problem that we've got? Because managing FOI is um, quite a uh, resource intensive sort of process. So I'll just leave that as a bit of a comment that we're aware of it. Do we have one more question just before Craig uh, goes on to answer? Please go, Craig. Oh. One else? Okay, I guess um, I'd like to draw your attention back to what was something discussed earlier today, GovForge. Um, and I think Chris is in the room. 
Um, and the whole idea of GovForge and the idea of creating a mechanism where government agencies can share code, can put and share code, helps bring that concept of doing that with external companies as well uh, much more into focus for government agencies. Right now it's extremely scary for a government department to pick up a lump of code and stick it on a server and run it because they don't know what will happen. They're worried about all the risks and so forth. So putting a framework that makes it safe for them to do that and making it accepted to do that goes a long way towards supporting this. That said, there are government agencies today who are picking up code and releasing it back um, and sharing it between agencies. I was involved in some of that Department of Health and Ageing where we actually were sharing our code with some other agencies um, and with Regional Australia when I worked there um, with Chris. Um, with the, the My Region website we actually built a plugin for Drupal which was then basically other people could use and all the code for the My Region website is actually available as a package now. So, so some of that is happening, it's just not very public. Alex? Yeah. yeah, I would just say with that bringing back of open source, the best example is the NSA have open sourced their crown jewels, which is this intelligence dashboard that is so far ahead of what people are doing on the internet right now. So you have like a list of terrorists and then you have a Google map and you can just drag and drop the terrorists to the map and see where they are. They've open sourced this so that people can actually write more plugins and I, I'm assuming there'll probably be some privacy invading social networks that will make widgets that will allow them to drag things. But anyway, this dragging system, and they open sourced it, and it was in uh, an act of um, Congress that says, you must open source this, and then they did. So, like, it's, it's not unheard of, of this relationship to happen. It, there just have to be some boundaries. So, you know, obviously for right to know, we wouldn't run the ACT government FOIR site, and some people have been really concerned when they think of that. You know, that you use the same software, the software can interoperate, so, you know, we're getting the civil society more engagement, but also they're getting the advantage of, like, for example, um, they would, we may have to make this thing to work out the dates that the various laws, um, deadlines come up, and, you know, you don't want to reproduce that. It took a lot of research to work out when things actually expire. So there is opportunity for this sharing between the civil society and the people, the government. Yep. Stephen, yep. Yeah. Um, I just thought I'd add to that because it's coming from the private sector. Um, this is actually part of my business strategy to co find cooperative funding pools so that we can do whole of government projects. The biggest problem is not actually the single application once it's deployed, it's the ongoing management of that as a product. So you actually need almost like a marketing team managing and aggregating the user base and understanding what they all need in the next version um, and sort of managing the version control and, and the release and the training and all that kind of stuff. But the Freedom of Information project is something that I've been trying to work out how we can actually get that going. I'd be very happy to talk to you about it. We've also got a project where I'm trying to pull together agencies in the United Arab Emirates who are willing to spend buckets of money on a particular project that aligns with a, a local agency because they have particular expertise in different areas. Um, and if you can start to, from a like, kind of creating that demand, pull it all together, then you see these projects as actual you know, thriving organic parts of this whole ecosystem, uh, not just you know, activist pieces. Cool. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. It's time for afternoon tea, so thank you all for coming, and please thank our panellists. <laughs>